Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome and thank you for coming. My name is Tasha Schrader. I am the marketing manager at Digital Crafts. I have with me a couple of our DIRs, which is what we call our TAs, uh, who recently went through our program and they'll be answering some questions. So uh, before we get started, um, just very quickly what's on deck. Um, like I said, we'll introduce um, your two grads. Uh, and then we have some things that we want to ask them, you know, just give an overview of digital crafts and then we'll open it up for Q&A. If you have questions for your speakers, please put them in the chat box and then we'll answer them at the end. So just real quickly about digital crafts. If you aren't familiar with us, we are the number one rated coding bootcamp in Atlanta and Houston. We've been around since 2015 and we teach full-time and part-time classes for uh, full stack web development. So in addition to those boot camps, we deliver training, job placement, and other services for corporate clients around the country. Um, so we're going to get started. Uh, I'm going to let the speakers introduce themselves. Um, so April and Claire, if you will just briefly say you know, what you're up to, what brought you to Digital Crafts, and then we'll go from there. Claire, you want to start? Sure. Um, so I was in the Digital Crafts cohort from September of 2018 to January of 2019. I was a, am a career changer. I was a librarian um, working in public libraries for over 10 years and then um, got interested in coding and <laughs> decided to change careers and uh, jumped off the cliff into boot camp, which was very, um, very intense but very rewarding experience. Um, and I am starting next week uh, at Emory University in a position in the IT and library department um, at Emory. I've been, for the past seven weeks, I've been TA for the new cohort, cohort that started in February here, which has also been um, very rewarding. And uh, as I just learning, keep on learning more and more. Um, my name is April, and I was also in the same cohort with Claire. Um, I'm also the other DIR. Uh, a little bit of my background, I used to do industrial electrical, and um, I decided once I got exposed to coding, um, that was pretty much enough for me to know that I wanted to switch careers. And I decided to come to Digital Crafts. And, um, I really just loved coding. Uh, it was a uh, yeah. So you, yeah, yeah. So you recently got hired as well. Is that right? Yeah. So in a couple of weeks, I'll be jumping into a startup venture, um, and I it would not have been possible if I had not coded. Awesome. Um, so we're gonna go ahead uh, onto our next question. Um, I'm curious uh, about your perspectives on the admissions process um, and what that was like for you. If you can talk about sort of the different steps, you know, um, you apply, we do a code assessment, and then you interview. Um, just what was that experience like for you? Uh, April, do you want to go first? So um, at the time, my interviewer was uh, with Zakia, and the test that we, that I had to take was it was pretty, it was pretty moderate. Um, it was, there were aspects of it that were challenging, there were aspects of it that were more straightforward. Um, but it's definitely geared more towards beginners who have already had their hands dirty with coding in some way, shape, or form. Um, as far as my experience with Zakia, um, it was awesome. I mean, she was very personable. Um, she spent over an hour with me on the phone, just trying to get to know me, get to know more about me. And that really made a big difference for me. Um, in coming here because I felt like uh, the company overall was just interested in me as a person, not a number. Um, so that was really, really nice. Um, I also interviewed with Zakia and um, let's see, I like got in sort of well ahead of time. I think I had applied even before the cohort before mine started, but I'm very, uh, I want to know things in advance, <laughs> so not very spontaneous. So um, I'd applied and then 
uh, anxiously waited to hear for, um, you know, whether I was going to get the interview and then did the, I think I did the test after, after the in-person interview. Um, and the testing, I think every step of the way just confirmed, like, that I had, I was going in the right direction and made the right decision, but I really, you know, was interested in, in getting into coding, um, especially like the test as frustrated as I was and sometimes felt like, you know, like what? I just, I don't understand, but it just, it was also engaging enough to keep me digging and working on the test. So, so the admissions process for me was, um, I had a little bit of anxiety because I tend to be anxious about things like that, but, um, but, you know, overall just confirmed that I was going in the right direction. So I think I heard both of you say that the code assessment um, was tough, but maybe fair. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you figured out how to solve that challenge um, and how digital crafts might have helped you along the way? Um, solving, I started out by Googling, I mean, I think, but, but also <laughs> we had a, we did have a packet of the resources that are, are recommended on, they're recommended on the website. I, honest, no, I guess it's not. <laughs> um, there are they're, some, they're recommended in both a series of emails and on the website. The, okay, there you go, thank you. It's been, <laughs> I've slept since then, so. Um, <laughs> yes, the, the recommended resources, I just kept going back, like, and then I read over the questions and was like, oh, I do know, okay, now I know how to solve this one, or I remember something about this, and then I would go back and forth. So I definitely went back and forth between the resources. I think it probably took me about a week to do, to do the mm -hmm. whole um, assessment. Mm -hmm. um, did you submit more than once? I did not. Okay. Um, I'm the kind of person who <laughs> has to let things go <laughs> before, I, you know, yeah. before I dig them into the ground, so. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, the, same, the process was pretty similar for me. I just um, think I went to a, I, I don't know, I was super nervous because it was something I've never experienced before. So I'm like, I need to have solid internet connection or some primary <laughs> and uh, just make sure like nothing would really interfere with my focus. And um, Google was, uh, at one point, there was, it's a blur now because it was a while ago, but there was one problem that I remember that was just, um, I was like, hmm, I gotta think about this. <laughs> and I went on to Google and um, just tried to play with it, work it out. And then I submitted my answer. But it was as long as somebody has like at least some basic uh, understanding of coding and, and actually understands that basic foundation, um, that was more so like what uh, it was testing for. And it was um, very feasible from there to like be able to solve in very lenient format, um, get like three chances to try, um, you know, should you, I think feedback each time if you don't, um, if you don't make it through the, you know, the first round or the second round. So it's, um, definitely don't stress yourself out about it, but take it seriously at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, we do give folks three chances, um, and it's not really a weed out process, it's, more of a useful tool to help applicants understand these this is sort of our baseline this is where we're starting from but we've also had people who've applied and said oh actually i'm not enjoying this at all and you know it's it's better for everybody if we are on the same page and you know it's we want you to be committed to the idea of learning to code um, so that's part of the process as well um, if you don't get it on the first try um, you again can make multiple attempts um, and our admissions team will give you feedback on some things that you might want to look at. So you, you do get help along the way, um, in addition to Googling or asking anyone else that you might know. Um, so you get input from us as well. Um, shifting gears just a little bit, I'm curious about why y'all chose digital crafts, um, whether there was just something about us that stood out to you or if you were looking at a few schools, um, you know, just sort of what brought you to us. April, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, so I was a little on the crazy side. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't really know what language I wanted to learn, where I wanted to start. Um, so I knew I wanted uh, to start with front-end development. Um, Counterintuitive, because I thought I'd be better at back-end. So I was like, let's torture myself with front-end so I can get good at that. And 
that just led me to JavaScript because that was like a dominant language on the front end. And so I, I didn't know what school I wanted to go to. I got my Venn diagram charts and like mapped out almost every school in the world that existed in different countries. And um, what really narrowed it down for me was there were other schools that might have had quote unquote higher reputations, but the class sizes for those schools were super large. Um, you know, I'd heard rumors about students being kicked out because they couldn't keep up with the pace of the boot camp for their statistics. And everywhere that I read for digital crafts reviews was just like, it, it wasn't about how great the program was, it was more so how great the people were. Like, it was just like these strong reviews about how dedicated uh, the teachers are. You know, they're, they're on their hands and knees trying to help you. And it was just review after review about person, people, person, people, person, people. And that was like the determining factor for me. It was just like, yeah, this, I, I, that's what I want. I want that whole mom and pop feel. Um, the class sizes are also much smaller. And that made sense for me, for like what I was looking for. And the last determining factor was just um, when I compared the list of technologies that digital crafts covered, um, the chart was just outweighing. It was, you know, close to double over like what we covered compared to other boot camps. The fact that it was four months long too, as opposed to like a traditional three month boot camp, which is pretty common. So just all in all, it was just like the humanitarian factor or human factor and uh, the tech stack, it being JavaScript based, not having to learn a second programming language as a beginner, focusing on one stack. All of those things for me was like, yup, this is where I'm going. <laughs> Perfect, what about you? Um, so I had way less research than I thought we did research, but I did less research. <laughs> um, so um, when we started, when um, I started thinking about going to a boot camp, I did did do some research. I checked out like course report, um, and there's a couple other ones whose names escape me right now. But obviously, digital crafts was for Atlanta. Um, definitely, you know at the top of all of those lists and kept kept kind of popping up. Um, for me, um, relocation wasn't an option, so definitely proximity was one of them, but we also talked to the other people who had been to different boot camps in the area and um, just kind of trying to get a, get a feel for it. Um, but I think the kind of the deciding factor was the career support that digital crafts offers and the um, the numbers as far as who they get hired. And then when I interviewed um, to get in, I kind of questioned that a little bit and was like, so what kind of jobs are we talking about? You know? And um, being at the point where I am now, I feel like, um, I definitely feel like everybody here is supportive and working towards you having a job. Um, not necessarily like, you, you know, you get out of boot camp one day, the next day you have a job, but just the whole, the whole process, um, that is sort of the end goal of everybody here and everybody's super supportive. So that turned out to be a good reason to pick digital crafts, but yeah, that was, that was my reason. Another thing for me too, with um, the whole job support was just how transparent digital crafts was with like, you know, some places have guaranteed offers, but again, like, some of those places kick you out if you can't keep up with the curriculum to keep those statistics true. So it's just digital crafts was super transparent about the fact that if you work hard, then you're the one who's guaranteeing your success. So I just mm -hmm. that for me was just like, yeah, this is the whole thing. Awesome. That is such a good response. Thank you. <laughs> um, and we will talk a bit more about career support in a later slide, just so y'all know. And again, we've just had a few more people join us. Um, there is a chat box. We will be taking your questions at the end. So as we go along, add your questions and then we will address them in the conclusion. So we're going to go ahead um, to our next slide. Um, and this, this is a broad question. Um, you know, what do you learn in a digital crafts boot camp? So, um, you know, we, we absolutely share our curriculum and we do stick to it, um, but for folks who maybe haven't gotten that yet, um, just can we talk on a high level about um, what you learned, um, maybe what surprised you, what was easier or harder than you anticipated? Um, <laughs> they're both laughing. <laughs> um, but I promise we were with you the whole time. <laughs> um, 
Claire, do you want to go ahead and sure. share this one? Um, I think, well, first of all, what, what I learned here was far more than just what the curriculum covered. Um, as far as curriculum, it's Python, JavaScript, PostgreSQL, um, Node Express, <laughs> <laughs> um, React. Um, we covered React Redux. Yeah, I think that's the highlights. Yeah. Oh, HTML, CSS, of course. Um, um, but I also learned like working together, um, supporting each other. Um, all the, all of the career stuff. There's a there's a whole career week. Um, and I think that the, just the sort of atmosphere in, um, which is something that April and I talked about throughout kind of the boot camp, um, the atmosphere in, in the tech community and in this boot camp is just very, very encouraging and supportive and community minded. Like if you're having trouble, I'm going to help you. And if, um, if I don't know it, we'll figure it out together. And that was coming from, you know, from our, the TA that we had, even from the instructor, you know, and which kind of made me feel better as someone learning, like even people who've been doing it for a long time don't necessarily have the answer off the top of their head, but we'll, you know, we'll work together to find the answer. Oh, yeah, I agree very much with Claire. Um, you know, for the most part, everything that's in the curriculum is what we focus on, but there's gonna be times where, um, Chris, uh, as an example, um, our instructor is just, so rad and just able to jump into anything really so you're going to be learning more than what's on that paper <laughs> you just kind of have to be ready to go with it um and that's really helpful too because it's like a healthy way to learn how to adapt um in a safe space mm -hmm. um but yeah yeah um i do want to talk about um some of our instructors on a high level um, Claire and April were in the same class at our Atlanta campus, um, but all of our instructors have, you know, a number of years of experience. They've worked with clients, so they know the sorts of things that are going to come up when you are working as a developer yourself. Um, Chris has published a book on front-end development. Um, you can find it on Amazon. Um, but Rob has five-star Udemy courses. Azam in Houston has the same thing. So, you know, you, no matter who you take a class with, you can trust that it's going to be someone with experience. Um, I lost my cursor here for a second. <laughs> there we go. Um, so here's a big question. What kind of time commitments are we talking about? Will I need to study outside of class? Um, how can I make sure that I'm going to be successful? Um, I think, well, to start off, Yes. <laughs> Short answer. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Like, yeah. absolutely no. Like, the average person for sure is just um, a lot of what we're covering is very dense and abstract. And if you've never been exposed to it before and you're not Elon Musk, then for <laughs> sure you're going to have to go home. Um, and it just comes down to what you're able to commit to. Um, personally, I had the time because I, I wasn't in a space where I had kids or um, those types of responsibilities, but I struggled just not having any experience with coding. Um, so, that, you know, sometimes I would study for six hours after class almost every day. And that was what I needed to be honest with myself to be able to address that. Well, I'm not really getting everything. So what do I need to do to be able to get there? And so I'm not saying that you need to study that much. You just need to be honest with yourself and know where you're at, be able to evaluate where you're at. And if you're picking it up for the most part, you know, just an hour or two after class is a great space to be in. But to just think that you can come to class and kind of um, look at the examples that we go over and not really reinforce it in your own time. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's very, it's a lot, of, it's a lot of information to take in. So for sure, um, keep in mind that that's the kind of commitment it takes to enter into a skill in four months, you know, that people have been doing for five, 10, 15, 20 years, and, you know, try to be able to enter the job force. Um, think of it as a commitment for this period of time where you're just going to give it your all, and you will definitely reap the rewards from that. Um, yes, I would say you're, you're going to get out what you're going to put in. 
and maybe there's someone out there who doesn't need to wouldn't need to study outside of class but i cannot really imagine that person um uh yeah if you're gonna get out what you put in and even from like a, a ta perspective the students who who get it um are still working outside of class to push themselves further and that's one of the great things about the tech the tech field is you can always you can always study outside of class you can always push yourself a little bit further um, my situation was a little bit different from April's and I have um, I have three kids uh, in grade school at home so I have to kind of when I go home in the evening that's what I'm dealing with but my alternative was I was getting here um, between 7 and 7 30 every morning and that's when I would do when I was really studying hard so I had to make the time that I did have matter more and it goes super fast. We, we go in class super fast. I mean, it's called a boot camp for a reason. So yes, you're going to have to keep up with it outside of class. I think for me, for the most part, two hours a day did it, but then um, but during project week, that goes out the window. Um, and uh, you know, putting in time on the weekends, at least two or three hours on the weekends as well would be probably a minimum. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure if either of you had that experience, but um, I've seen a lot of students studying together mm -hmm. um, or, you know, maybe the folks who get it share with others. Um, can you talk a little bit about that experience? Um, we like one thing that our cohort did was created a, like an interview prep group um, and people would get together. I think it was I think it was after after class one day during the week, um, which was why I didn't end up going to it. Um, but yes, that was definitely um, working working together to find, mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's another thing about this with the tech environment is that everybody's wanting to help each other mm -hmm. out. Um, and it was a cool thing to see in our class and definitely to watch as a TA as people, people making new friends and then finding partners that they work together really mm -hmm. well with. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you're definitely learning from your classmates as well as from your instructor. Mm -hmm. um, and this actually leads us into our next question, which is what is the campus like? So in Atlanta, um, we are in Atlanta Tech Village, which is a co-working space. There are lots of startups here. There's lots of events. Um, and the same is true for Houston. Um, we're currently at headquarters, but we'll be moving to another location in the near future. Um, but, you know, both are homes to tech-minded people with lots of things going on. Um, so if y'all could just talk a little bit about maybe the meetups or events or even some of the perks of the building um, <laughs> that you thought were useful. Yeah, so I, the environment here is pretty epic. I mean, besides Digital Crafts, which is just a strong, strong, strong team, um, the building is filled with a bunch of companies that are like, striving for their own dreams and goals. So you're constantly surrounded by that kind of energy the minute you walk in the door. It's very positive, very collaborative. Um, you can gain weight too if you want. There's a bunch of, <laughs> a bunch of free snacks. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's like switching from the career that I used to be in. Um, being here just helped me believe in myself because um, you're surrounded by people that as soon as you're stuck on something, um, they're literally right there next to you just saying, like, what can I do to help you? And then you sit next to each other, you focus on the same thing, and then you solve it. And it's like, you have that moment where you look into each other's eyes, and you high five, <laughs> and to just be able to go into a space where you can have that experience every day is just really, really empowered. Yeah. The, um, yeah, I mean, the, the building itself is cool. I had seen it, but never had a reason to come here, but it's just like, it's a Atlanta Tech Village. It's just, it's pretty cool. And yeah, it's just very, I mean, you step into the elevator and people are like, so what do you do in the building? And you start up a conversation, you've got a connection and you know, who knows, that may turn into a job. You know, you never yeah. know. It's just very, um, very, it's got that energy, that, that startup energy. Yeah. Yeah, we've definitely had students get hired by companies in Atlanta Tech Village, you know, just because of those conversations. Um, you know, we have a community lunch on Friday at ATV. Um, 
you know, so you can meet lots of entrepreneurs or new programmers. Um, you know, you can meet folks who have just started in a role or maybe who have been in one for 10 years. Um, sort of pick their brains and learn from them as well. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of great stuff going on. There are lots of meetups as well, um, not just, you know, web development, but some mobile, some classes on entrepreneurship and those sorts of things as well. Um, so we're going to go to our next question, which is how does digital crafts prepare you for the job search? We've touched on a lot of different things, but, um, you know, if we can sort of reiterate those and then talk about the career prep that we do. Do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, so one of our, actually one of our jobs as TAs is to do what's called the algorithm Friday. Um, so technical, technical interviews for web dev jobs um, often include whiteboarding or otherwise um, working through different algorithms or coding problems. So um, what our DIRs did for us and what April and I attempt to do for our, um, the students here now is sort of broach that subject and kind of dip toes in the water of what does an algorithm look like? Here are some that you know, we've seen in interviews um, and here's how to work through them. So the DIRs do that, um, but there's also, there's a career week. Um, there's, which is speakers from um, lots of different, in the tech field, but covering different subjects. Um, let's see, we work on we work on our resumes and portfolios. There's um, one person who's dedicated to, um, you submit your resume, your portfolio, your LinkedIn profile, anything, anything you want to submit, and um, they will go over it and, you know, give you pointers and kind of give you a score and tell you things that you can um, improve upon to up that score. Um, and then at the end of it, there's, um, there, you're, one of the things you gain in class is a network, um, but at the end of it, you also got um, the, the digital craft specific sort of career network who, that will you know, aid you in trying to get a job, uh, hand your resume out or you know, send your resume to people who are looking for um, developers. Anything you would like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to be learning the, the most up-to-date technologies, so that's super helpful. Um, when I was more so trying to be self-taught, um, and then coming here, I realized, oh dear. Um, <laughs> you don't know what you don't know, and so mm -hmm. it's hard to know what you need to know in order to break into the market. And so um, here you really get like this spearheaded perspective on the stuff that's going to take you to the top of the list to make you eligible when you do begin your job search. And then you do have access to like, um, uh, because, because the career uh, team here, um, is, they're always researching and always um, getting to jobs that come up very quickly that might not even be on Indeed or Monster or anything like that. And so you have direct access to be able to apply to those jobs as soon as they're available. So that's very helpful. Yeah, that's, that's one of the benefits to the other arms of the company, our professional services side. Um, we have clients um, of our own, you know, primarily in Atlanta and Houston, but also in other locations, who come to us when they need developers. Um, so we are able to connect our alumni with those folks, and that is how we are able to learn about roles that might not be available anywhere else. Uh, I'm curious about building a portfolio. Can you talk about what that experience was like? I know personally, and this is from a marketing perspective, so it's very different, but you, when I built my portfolio, I felt like I was telling one story and then I shared it with somebody for critique and they took something else away entirely. So just personally, I think having someone else look at your portfolio was really helpful. But if either of you could talk about just the experience of creating it, um, you know, and then what the critique is like. Um, I certainly understand what you're saying, Kasha, about having you intend one thing and then somebody else can look at it and go, oh, this is what I'm getting. And you're like, what? <laughs> but one of the nice things is having, um, you will have at the very minimum, you know, your classmates, all of your classmates will look at your portfolio. And then also the, um, career 
person here at Digital Crafts will look at your portfolio and give you pointers. And I think um, some of my pointers included um, like making sure that I had a, you know, a professional looking picture, so updating the picture. Um, and making sure that all the like all the links the links worked on my portfolio and you know she said suggesting like make sure that your your uh, LinkedIn link opens in a new tab so very um, detailed stuff like that that it's very easy to miss when you've been staring at it for two weeks or whatever <laughs> and we we start it early and then go back to it. Uh, several times over the course of the four months. Yeah, the portfolio is, um, that's like what's showcasing you. Um, that's your presentation. It's the first thing people are going to see when they um, consider looking at you. So I would just recommend a healthy dose of honesty. Um, nothing can ever be too perfect. Um, and so like when you're learning, just keep pushing yourself to be honest or um, be true to yourself. You know, you want to have a dose of creativity, something that highlights who you are. Um, follow your instincts um, and find a way to mix that with what advice you're getting from other people. Um, but also um, step into it with just like a, an honest approach of just like um, maybe it, you know, it, it might not be perfect or, you know, it might not be, especially building this kind of stuff from scratch. It can be really, really hard as a beginner to build it from scratch and make it look good. So just strive for, look at others, um, strive for that level of excellence and you'll stand out. Yeah, I think you make a really good point about um, bringing some of your personality into mm -hmm. your portfolio um, or your projects that you choose to include so that you know, people get a sense of who you are um, in addition to your capabilities. While at the same time, you still want to demonstrate those skills that employers are looking for. Uh, can you talk a little bit about where those projects come from? So my, my projects came from, some of them came from digital crafts, like the group projects that we built together. Um, those are always a good in your portfolio to show employers um, tangible proof that you actually built something, contributed to something, because you're going to be working in a team in real life. And then some of my projects were personal projects that were independent, not required by class. And that's helpful too, because um, then it shows that you, you're you doing this for you, not, you know, not necessarily, everybody needs a job and that's understandable, but um, it can definitely help to come off as someone who's doing this because even if they weren't getting paid to do it, they'd still be doing it. Um, because it's then it's for you at that point and and that breeds through your work yeah my um my portfolio is is the last three projects that we did we have four projects um front end full stack and then a mini react and then a, your final project which can be any number of things mine turn out to be react but um it's the last my portfolio does has the, those last three projects because um, I am really proud of um, what what's on them. Uh, some people I know included outside projects and things that they were working on. I didn't have the time to make any of my outside projects sort of portfolio worthy. Um, that was a, a goal that I didn't get to, but um, I know that um, I have gotten positive feedbacks about the about the projects that are on my portfolio. You know, so. From from outside people, not just from my mom and dad, <laughs> but from you know from outside people. So they're definitely worthwhile. Yeah. Maybe don't add them in. Like if you're not proud of it, if it doesn't pass your standards, don't put them in the portfolio. Really, just put stuff that you're proud of in, yeah. in there. Um, that is, it represents who you are. Yeah, yeah, definitely um, a good point about not padding your portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> you might have quality projects. Um, and, you know, uh, Claire, you alluded to this, but we do pause at various points during the boot camp for you to build projects, um, you know, as we go, just sort of recapping what you learned up to that point. Uh, your final project is shown off on what we call Demo Day, which is sort of science fair style. Everybody shows off what they're doing. You bring, you know, your kids, your folks, you know, whomever. Um, but we also, um, 
invite employers to attend as well. So it's a little bit of a celebration and showing off what you've done. Um, you know, I just sort of off the cuff, um, can you talk about your demo day experience and sort of what that's like as a student? Um, obviously, I, I know what it's like on the employee side. Um, so. Um, my demo day was, it was a huge relief in some ways because it comes after two solid weeks of intense coding and very being very tightly focused on just this one project. Um, so in that way, Demo Day was a relief, um, but it's also also pretty nerve wracking. Um, I'm not a huge fan of speaking in public <laughs> and <laughs> standing up in front of people, but it's very low key once you're in there because you know you're not sort of on you're on display, but not you're not like the spotlight's not on you because there's all the other projects too, and people just kind of walk through and you know ask you different things about your project and you know some might be technical questions some might be very non-technical questions um yeah but people are there to support you you know you're yeah. not up in front of the entire crowd no, presenting no, your project you know um and you might have some time to go look at other people's projects if you haven't yeah. checked them out yet already um so both of you have gotten jobs uh, after being DIRs. Um, can you just talk a little bit about your interview experience? Um, if you sent out a bunch of resumes or if you had built your relationships along the way that were helpful, um, you know, just sort of what's next for y'all? Um, so my situation was a little unique because um, I was switching from uh, kind of a niche industry and uh, one of the reasons I got into coding, apart from wanting to help people, was more um, learning something new brought to my awareness that things in my old career could have been done more efficiently. And so um, that just opened up opportunities with the person that I used to work for. Um, and so like, I, I did have traditional interviews, um, opportunities that opened up just from coming to this class, um, building networks, be super nice to people, be <laughs> nice, because those are the people that are going to be the ones saying, hey, I know this person, you know, they're, they're super awesome, they're super great, you should really give them a chance. Um, so really consider, like, how you treat everybody every day when you're here. Um, but in the end, I just wound up deciding to pursue um, more my own venture. Um, and so that's, I get to, you know, that's not going to be something that's common that happens um, to everyone. But at the same time, if I hadn't come here, I wouldn't even know how to navigate even this kind of an opportunity either. So. I guess my was slightly more of a um, common path. Um, I have, I did apply to a ton of different, different places. I had a little spreadsheet of, you know, where I, where I applied at, whether it was LinkedIn or the the site website or whatever, um, and got a few, a, a small percentage of callbacks for interviews, which I think is basically par um, for the course. And um, out of those interviews, the, um, the one that eventually did offer to me and I accepted Emory, um, I did have a couple people that I know that work at Emory that I could put not, not in that department, but at least to have a name to put down as a, a sort of a connection, a referral, that's definitely worth its weight in gold um, as far as having, having a foot in the door, just or having someone that knows your face somewhere at the company. Um, and as April said, Sometimes you don't know who that's going to be, so make sure you don't treat anybody badly, <laughs> um, especially in a building like ATV. You know, you don't know when the, the person you, um, I don't know, took the last cup of coffee from and didn't make a new one is going to be the guy who's interviewing you for a job. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. we laugh, but you know, it is, it is a valid point that um, tech communities, while they can feel very large, uh, you know, and Atlanta and Houston mm -hmm. have millions of people, but you do get to know mm -hmm. each other, and um, even those informal references mm -hmm. are important. Um, so, yes, absolutely be kind, go to your meetups, meet folks, mm -hmm. um, but also, yeah, just 
make those connections. Right. Think about you know what you want. Um, talk to people about it. Informational interviews are equally important. Um, sometimes those can be casual and around the coffee maker as you're waiting for <laughs> your morning cup yeah. of coffee to brew. Um, so we had uh, planned to open it up for your questions. I don't see any in the chat box. Um, so go ahead and add those if you do have questions. I'm gonna go ahead with our last few slides um, and then we will see if y'all have anything else you need um, and then we will wrap it up. So what we have next is just what are the next classes? Um, we are enrolling now. We do have a full-time cohort um, starting April 15th. Um, we are full in Atlanta for April 15th, um, but we'll happily enroll you for the next session, June 24. We do have space in Houston and we are enrolling uh, at both classes for the flex cohort and that is um, nights and weekends, so not full-time. Um, there are lots of questions that come up as you are figuring out which boot camp or if you even want to go to a boot camp. Um, you know, so check out our website. Um, we have lots and lots of info for you. Um, I would check out the FAQ page, check out the tuition page. Um, folks tend to have a lot of questions about payment options and those are all outlined. You should also go to the blog. The most recent posts talk about questions you should ask yourself before you apply for a boot camp, for example, or how to finance with a particular lender or what scholarships do we have available. And if you check all of those out um, and you still have a question, you are always welcome to email us at hello at digitalcrafts.com. So that's our last slide. Um, so we have a question, did anyone do the part-time cohort. Um, not anybody who is with us today, um, but those are ongoing a couple times a year. Um, those are longer sessions. Um, the full-time class is 16 weeks, part-time is 26 weeks, but again, that's Tuesday, Thursday evenings, and then occasional Saturdays. Um, did it take a toll on your full-time job? I think you would want to be thoughtful about whether you have the time to commit because you are still going to not only attend class, but need to continue learning and reinforcing what you've learned in class as well. No, it would have to be full-time during a flex cohort. Yeah, so most of the folks who attend a flex class um, have a full-time job. Um, we do have a lot of career switchers as well. Um, you know, so they're trying to do their full-time job and, you know, learn something new. So yeah, you, you do need to think about um, your availability as well. I think that, if, if I may, yeah, the, the nice thing about the, the flex is obviously if you don't have the ability to not work at right, another job right. for four months. Um, I have talked to some people at a meetup who were, we ended up having a digital crafts table at mm -hmm. my last Women, um, Women Who Code Atlanta group meeting um, and two of them were from the flex co had done flex cohorts before and so they they did have a slightly different experience um, and I think that what I got from them was like they wish that they could have done full time um, just because I think having it be longer stretch of the time I mean you get to dig a little deeper mm -hmm. maybe um, but you know the flip side of that is you have to be able to quit your job. And um, right. neither one of them, however, said, did say anything about it taking a toll on their full-time job. So I, maybe, you know, just taking into account how much, like how much attention do you have to pay to your full-time job outside of regular work hours? You know, can you just leave it all at work while you come learn all this new stuff? And we do have people who um, are in the part-time class because they're learning new skills to learn in their current job. You know, not everyone is changing jobs or changing careers. Um, so of course, in that case, they need to learn after work as well. Um, so it looks like we haven't had any more questions come in, but I will email y'all um, after the webinar uh, with the links that we have in the slides. Um, we probably just share the slides with you as well. Um, take a look at those resources. If you still have questions, like I said, you are always welcome to email us at hello at digitalcast.com. 
to thank you to our two speakers uh, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Um,